Hello everyone. I wanted to do a video just on the subject of how I went about painting these um, figures of US Marine Corps from World War II from the Assault Group. Um, it's not meant to be a tutorial. I'm not presenting myself as particularly expert in this subject. In fact, these are the first figures I've ever painted of US Marines, um, but I, I just wanted to um, uh, show what I um, have come across in my brief period of research and um, why I chose particular paints and so on and just give you an idea of how I set about doing it. Um, partly because um, as an initial, you know, sort of uh, start f to doing these figures, I did have a, quite a search of the internet and YouTube and um, didn't really find a great deal um, on offer to sort of help me. Um, the most help I found on YouTube was actually, by coincidence, Anthony at Grana Priego um, recently put up a, a showcase of his US Marines. Um, but apart from that, really not much going on on YouTube and um, the internet was a little bit uh, sparse as well, I have to admit. So um, I started with the internet and um, as I say, these figures are from the assault group. Now, in um, earlier years, uh, not any longer, unfortunately, um, the assault group had a website they still have a website, but the, the old website used to have a really good um, few pages on it where painters had, had um, contributed photographs of their work and had also sometimes written articles that um, the Assault Group published on the website um, showing what paints they used and uh, etc. And I actually found that very useful when I painted up um, my Japanese but um, it's been a few years now where the website changed um, I suspect it's this sort of uh, trend towards favoring Facebook rather than uh, web pages um, nowadays and and the assault groups website has actually I think it's declined a little bit um, I mean it's still you know a useful website obviously for buying the, their figures and um, uh, you know, sort of perusing their ranges and so on, but but um, in terms of uh, exa painted examples and so on, and and tips and guides and so on, um, it's it's stopped all that completely. Um, that and also to make matters worse, um, there is a photograph as the sort of header, as the, t as the title, the page title, um, showing an example of their painted marines. Um, I'll, 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 I'll put a screen grab up of it over this so you can see what I mean. Um, and as I say, I am no expert, but that, that those figures don't look right to me at all. Um, they they have they've been given unless it's the lighting or something it makes them you know look odd but they they seem to have been painted in a sort of yellowish um khaki kind of color almost makes them look like they're they're kitted out for the desert um doesn't look right at all from from my limited knowledge um of you know of what i've found out so far they the, the colors are, are totally inappropriate so you can't go by that um, the best thing online that I found was a, a, a they were called Farnworth Colours. Now they have a page. I don't know whether it's still on the North Star, but they obviously there's a North Star header to the page. So whether it's still available on North Star's um, website, I've, I had a look and can't find it. But if you if you Google Farnworth Colours, you'll come across it. And that has quite a useful um, painting guide with uh, suggestions for paints. Um, unfortunately, uh, um, it's not the sort of uh, a paint range that I would 
I would go for myself. They use they they suggest a lot of Vallejo colours. Um, I I have got Vallejo paints, um, but my preferred uh, set set of paints is Foundry. I really like Foundry's um, triad system. So I'm going to give you some suggestions for some other paints other than the ones on Farmworth Colours um, that they suggest. <clears throat> now, um, after the internet, of course, we all um, <coughs> we all um, go for Osprey. Um, I bought a couple of sorry, get that clear out of the way. I bought a couple of Osprey books to lend me a hand. Now, this again, this goes back to my very kind of um, you know basic understanding, or what I thought was. Um, understanding of the way marines dressed during the second world war um i knew at guadalcanal and on the, in the solomon islands that um they were dressed in a sort of plain sort of uh uniform not camouflaged which is the sort of archetypal um u.s marine corps dress that we tend to think of um, that's regarding war in the pacific so this particular book, um, all the all the illustrations. I have to find one now. In a hurry. Uh, it's Japanese. Uh, there we go. Um, they're all painted in this very plain um, uh, colour. Now um, the colour itself. Uh, I'll go into that. I'll go into that in a minute. Um, but the colour itself isn't khaki, but it is a sort of, it's what's described as sort of sage green kind of colour, so greenish grey kind of colour. But I was, I wanted to have some camouflage on my um, figures. I didn't want them to be completely plain. Um, uh, but at the same time, I wasn't confident that I could achieve a total camouflage look. So I I decided to go just for um, camouflaged helmets and the sage green coloured clothing. Um, now in this second Osprey book that I purchased, um, there are plenty of illustrations, and this is the kind of thing that I was aiming for. Um, now. My sort of misunderstanding, my misconception was that as the war went on, the green sort of disappeared and more camouflage came in to um, into use. But I was wrong on that. Um, so in case that's what you were thinking as well, just want to show you um, the other resource that I went to, which isn't something um that it appears to be commonly available to um most war gamers because i've mentioned this before and never really had a anyone comment to say that they have this um but this was a magazine military illustrated it started in 1984 <clears throat> and um it's not been published in many years now but it went to 275 issues um, I've got every single one and I just find this an invaluable source of information uh, and painting guides and so on as well as history but it's mainly um, it mainly deals with uniforms from every conceivable era of uh, military history um, so I thought I would look in in these and I've got the, I've got um, there was an index in edition 143 and then during lockdown I, I um, uh, made my own index for all the uh, editions following that up to 275 and I found in particular um, three articles on US Marine camouflage uniforms um, by a chap called Jim Moran who is a collector um, of uniforms and this was far and away the most uh, comprehensive and uh, clear 
uh, idea of of uh, how the uniforms changed during the uh, the Second World War. So it's all in a nutshell, really, in this first sort of couple of opening paragraphs. But um, what he's what he's he basically describes in the background um, information is that when America entered the war um, in December 1941. Um, the Marines had been considering camouflage clothing, but hadn't got very far um, with uh, equipping their troops with it. Hadn't got anywhere, in fact. Um, and a lot of the Marines were equipped with items that dated back to World War One. Now, just before Pearl Harbor, um, a new utility working and combat uniform was introduced, um, and that was. Uh, herringbone twill so hbt sage green um now the herringbone twill sage green is how i've tried to uh represent um these figures um it was a greenish gray or grayish green rather and um with use it faded changed color so in illustrations you will see a lot of examples of of it and um, they all have a sort of slightly different coloration which is fine um, however this article is really about the camouflage so I needed I needed this to understand how to paint the helmets um, I didn't want to paint the uh, clothing the utilities actually as camouflage so um, what he describes and it gives some examples of it is that um, first of all um, the marines were issued with a one piece one piece set of overalls that were camouflaged so here is an example of it now the the camouflage itself is double-sided which is quite important so there are two that immediately gives you two choices of camouflage scheme that you could paint your figures. Um, there's what's known as a brown and a green version. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, but just to say that this one piece overall was totally impractical and highly unpopular, mainly because um, in the tropics, um, with all the sort of stomach ailments and so on, that would, that did the rounds, um, it it was impossible to kind of uh, uh, evacuate your bowels wearing this one piece suit. There was no kind of uh, flap at the back uh, to give you an opening. You had to, you had to virtually undress in, if you wanted to go to the uh, the toilet and. Um, that was wasn't you know wasn't just wasn't suitable for combat um but very swiftly after that you get the introduction of the two-piece so separate uh, jacket and trousers and lots of pictures of his uh, from this guy's collection here um this initially so this came this started being introduced i think around 1943 um, yeah, I think 1943. Don't again. I'm no expert, so don't don't quote me on that. Um, yeah, 1943. First pattern two piece of camouflage. So 1943. Um, initially, it it was quite a popular apparel because it denoted a kind of an elite status. Uh, to the Marines, so they were quite happily wore it, um, but they rapidly found um, that they didn't like it. Um, two main reasons for that. One was because it had uh, colours on both sides, um, it made it very difficult to perspire. Uh, well, you could perspire all right, but the trouble is there was no way of the sweat evaporating off the body um, through these two layers of camouflage. So it was very uncomfortable to wear. Um, and second to that as well is that um, camouflage is fine as long as you're not moving. 
um, the minute you start to move, camouflage gives away your position rather than um, hiding you. Um, so as a sort of fighting piece of apparel, it was inappropriate as well. It's fine if you, if you want to be camouflaged and sit around as a sniper or hidden in a certain position, it's great. But um, start running in it and you become an easier target to hit. Um, so the camouflage began to fall out of favour um, and the Marines reverted to mixing um, jackets and trousers and so on, so having some with sage green, some camouflaged, and um, they, almost, they almost completely, by the end of the war, by 1944 in fact, had reverted to um, keeping the camouflage on their covers on their helmets, but wearing the sage green uniform again. Um, and I was quite glad to discover that because um, I've always been more interested, I must admit, in um, battles on islands such as Iwo Jima and Saipan and so on, Okinawa, rather than um, the earlier battles on um, the Solomons. So um, it worked out quite well for me that I had chosen this uh, colour scheme anyway, but that was just... Uh, fortunate coincidence. Um, the camouflage itself, the brown, which is on the inside of this one here, um, so the green green camouflage is on the outside and the brown is just underneath the lapel there and on the inside that you can see. Um, the... Uh, oh, excuse me, sorry, I'm about to sneeze. Um, the brown camouflage was intended really for beaches um, so it consisted of three colours, is it? A background colour, which is a kind of brownish colour, light brown, and then two other colours, a dark brown and a lighter brown. The um, green, on the other hand, um, is has got a background of a sort of... Um, it looks brownish, but in fact, it's uh, one description I've seen is of it as a sort of parched grass colour, so a very kind of dry grass colour. And then there is one green colour in it and two browns. One is a light brown and one is a dark brown. Um, so that is four colours. So there's three colours in the brown, four colours in the, uh, the green scheme. Um, on, this, on these helmets, I've chosen to go for the green scheme. So I've got a four colour pattern there, and I'll tell you about what paints I used and so on in a moment. Now, um, the green, the sage green um, utilities actually changed uh, towards right towards the end of the war. So um, on Tarawa, it was noticed that um, a lot of the Marines were discarding their um, items of webbing and so on, pouches and bags and such like, and stacking all their ammunition into their pockets. Um, so they developed a newer version of the utilities that had a lot more pouches, a lot deeper pockets and pouches. Um, so you can date um you can date a marine partly uh, if he's if he's if the figure has got a lot of deep pockets on the front of the trousers for instance then you know that is a late war marine however um they weren't issued in vast numbers so this is fine to represent a late war marine as well um Uh, I just want to show you some of the other pictures in here before I go on to talking about the paints. So this is another page. Um, th there were three articles in this series uh, by the same author showing items from his collection. And um, there were dr different items of clothing issued to... Um, they had the same camouflage patterns on them, but they were slightly different in their configurations and so on that were issued to uh, raiders, um, so sort of specialist units within the Marines and to paratroopers as well. Um, so I think a bit further on. 
there we got some hammer troop smocks and so on uh, but you can see that the camouflage patterns are exactly the same as the regular marines um, so I found in um, in uh, Military Illustrated I did find some other articles that just have some quite nice illustrations so I thought I'd show you those um, so this is an article on Tarawa and uh, it's an interesting illustration really but um, on this you can see I'm going to focus I think you can see anyway that the Marines on here have got a lot of camouflage because this is uh, early on in the in the sort of issue of the camouflage items um, so there's a lot of camouflage there but there are some figures that are wearing green or I've got a mixture of camouflage tops say and green green bottoms and so on um, so basically you can't go wrong you can't you can mix and match you know whatever you want and still find something that's not historically inaccurate and then finally just show you this one here this is an article on Iwo Jima um, so this is this is where pr prior to painting these figures I had assumed that on it by the time of Iwo Jima the Marines were all wearing almost entirely camouflage I don't know how I got that idea um, maybe from Hollywood or something like that because um, it certainly looks cool but um, they they the, the camouflage as I say turned out to be very unpopular but this is a marine on um, Iwo Jima and you can see he's uh, dressed in in exactly the same fashion as the figure there so camouflaged helmet um, possibly that's the brown camouflage the ones at the back certainly look like the green but that looks like it's only got three colors on it and the sage green utilities um, so now I'll just go on to some of the paints that I used um, as I say I much prefer foundry if I can use it so um, Farnworth colors actually for the Harry Mode Tweed Green uh, they re they um, recommend a Vallejo colour which is green grey which is number 886 by the look of it um, now as I say the, the sage green um, varied an enormous amount anyway but I've, I, I think this is a pretty good representation of the colour which is Foundry's Storm Green so it's a triad system so you get three um, shades of Storm Green um, if anything maybe it's a little bit fresh so it doesn't look as though it's been kind of worn in um, it's quite a fresh kind of colour um, but as I say that colour turns sort of all, all different shades depending on the conditions that it's uh, for, you know fought in that how much sunlight how much w water gets on it how many times it's washed um, so you can get away with virtually anything but I, I I would recommend foundry storm green and the beauty of the triad system is it does give you a really nice kind of depth to the uh, you know to the surface I always find Vallejo or Vallejo with a wash um, tends to kind of look a bit flat to me but having said that I did go along with Farnworth Colours um, suggestion for the webbing um, so you can see on the water bottle and the belt there that he recommends German Vallejo German camouflage beige which is number 821 so I basically use that and then put a sepia wash onto it and then pick the highlights out again um, with uh, the set of another application of the same colour. Um, I don't suppose I need to, I, I mean leather is leather, you can pick your own colours for that but I, I tend to use uh, Bay Brown from 
baby brown shade from foundry followed by the tan shade and then the tan middle color but don't use the tan highlight which is a little bit too orangey for my taste um, now the actual camouflage um, that I th I've gone for a little bit more of a kind of uh, uh, my own recipe so you won't be able to get many of these colors um, we well would but you'd have to sort of mix them up and so on um, so for the basic uh, parched green background color on the helmet I've chosen Foundry's Light Moss, which is number 29C. Um, but then for the other colours, I've gone for um, some transparent paints from a company called War Colours, which I've mentioned on previous um, videos that I tend to favour. They're, they're based in Cyprus. Um, so since we've left the EU I haven't attempted to buy any more of those paints but um, I would imagine they are a little bit more difficult to get hold of in the UK now I don't know um, I'll have to cross that bridge when I come to it um, but I started off so I painted painted the whole helmet with the light moss to begin with and then I went from the lighter colors up to the darker um, and that's because uh, transparent colours show lighter colours through them better, if that makes sense. So the light green, I use the mix of transparent green and transparent yellow to make it into a sort of lightish green colour. Um, then the light brown, <coughs> I used a mix of transparent ochre and transparent yellow um, and got that to kind of uh, shade that I'd liked and then applied that and then over the top of all that I put dabs of uh, neat transparent brown and the nice thing about all these transparent colors is that they don't they, they kind of lose their edge a little bit so the background colors show through them um, but they don't have that very um, kind of exaggerated edge between different colours. Um, and it's, it's a technique I, I like, but, um, you know, do your own thing, really. I'm not trying to, uh, as I say, to give you a tutorial or anything like that. It's just what, what I chose to paint them with. Um, and then finally, just a couple of other things... Um, that I found out that might be useful to you. Um, there's a couple of these figures throwing grenades. Now, up until 1943, so again, if you're a kind of button counter or anything like that, um, you would be able to identify the age of, a, you know, what period the figure is set in by the colour of the grenade. Because up until 1943, the grenades were yellow. Um, again, a bit like with the camouflage patterning, which was found to be impractical for fighting in um, yellow grenades aren't a good idea because you throw them at the Japanese and they can spot them immediately uh, especially in the dark uh, pick them up and throw them back at you so from 1943 they switched to painting grenades olive drab um, it's a little factoid for you and then this figure has got one of these flags that uh, as I said I don't like these on the figures um, but just to give you a bit of background on the flags, um, then they, they, what they actually were, they weren't sort of battle standards or anything like that. Um, they, were, they were popular as kind of souvenirs and trophies, um, but the Japanese soldiers often took into battle um, what were really autographs um, on flags of family and friends and so on. Um, so they're almost like going away good luck cards <laughs> that were given to the soldiers. Um, so they would have a lot of uh, uh, Japanese script, kanji on them, um, sometimes painted in very bold lettering, sometimes just scribbled, you know, so almost minutely so that you could barely see them. 
Um, but the, predominantly these were the flags that were taken as trophies uh, by soldiers rather than captured from um, flagpoles or, or camps or whatever, uh, headquarters, positions that were captured. Uh, nine times out of ten, the flags that you see being uh, shown as trophies are taken off of Japanese bodies and they were worn um, put sometimes close to the skin. I mean, the Japanese also um, had these thousand stitch belts uh, that women um, stitched for their husbands and sons and so on. And they were meant to ward off almost like, almost like a sort of uh, warding off bullets, sort of uh, lucky, lucky belts to wear. Um, but but, but uh, what was close to the body as well or um, was these was these things and these these tended to be the things that were pilfered by from bodies by the, by the marines um, I as I said in an earlier video I really don't feel that they would have worn them in that fashion um, and it's one thing I don't like about the assault groups range is that um, there are too many of them portrayed with these flags hanging from there their belts and I think it would have made them very conspicuous a conspicuous target in the same way that uh, they gave up wearing the camouflage because they stood out um, when moving and so on the same reason they wouldn't have then reverted back to the green uniform and stuffed red and white symbols in there in there to make them easier targets um, and that is more or less it I think uh, a little bit garbled a little bit rambly um, but uh, really getting into painting these marines and uh, as I say I did find it a little bit difficult to uh, decide which way to go so I hope that's helped you if you're considering painting any marines in the near future. Thanks for watching.